I'm an accountant. I'm a teacher. I am a junior. I am a wife. I am a mother. I'm a designer. I'm a chemist. I am a housekeeper. I am a father. I am a yoga instructor. I am a musician. I am a hunter. I'm a Christian. I'm a martial artist. I am a Mexican. I am a friend. I am a sister. I'm a youth leader. I'm an soccer player. I am an artist. I am an actor. I am thankful. I am tired. <laughs> I am proud to be me. forgiven for. Because if we forget that, then we miss out on the significance, the value of this, who we are in Christ. We're redeemed and we're forgiven. And so we've been redeemed in this passage. It says, in the redemption of his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And that's a word that we throw around a lot, the word sins, but I think sometimes we forget really what sin is and the magnitude of how God sees it. And, and just kind of come up with a, with a little definition of sin for you today. There's a couple different ways we can look at it. One is we have inherited sin. Inherited sin means that through Adam we inherited this bent toward just being sinful. Not just a bent, but that's who we are. Our identity when we're born on this earth, when we're born on this earth, we're born as sinners. We're not people who are relatively good that sometimes mess up or as psychiatrists like to tell us, you know, deep down in there, there's somebody that's good just waiting to come out. And it depends on how you're brought up and all this. What, we're, what the scripture tells us is we're born as sinners. And sinners sin. Sinners sin. That's what we do. And so we're born in sin. Adam passed this on to us. That's a very basic premise of our faith. And it's important that we understand that. But then when there's personal sins. So there's inherited sins and there's personal sins. When we break God's law. When we do life apart from God and what he says, here's how it should be done, that's sin as well. And so maybe some practical ways to look at sin is this. Sin is rebellion against God's ways. Rebellion against God's ways. Anybody who has kids understands the concept of rebellion. A kid says, I'm not doing it, or through their actions, they may do it, but they don't really want to do it or they pout and fuss and argue the entire time. Rebellion against God. And another way to, to think about this is, is a mindset or some people who actually say, God, I don't need you. I don't want you involved in this part of my life. I got this covered on my own. So think about your life for a second. Is there parts of your life where you maybe don't verbalize it and say, God, I don't need you there. But does your actions say that God... This part of my life is off limits for you. That you can have a lot of my life, but this area I need to fulfill me. And so therefore, God, you're not invited into that area. What are those areas in your life? And then another way practically to look at it is preferring anything above God. Preferring anything above God. It's a lot the same thing, saying the same thing, but just in different ways. But preferring anything above God. And so we won't see the greatness of the gospel until we see that when we talk about sin, that we start with us. We've got to make this real personal. We've got to let the spotlight shine on our lives today and understand the severity of our sin and how awful it is and how subtle it is to begin to think about sin in light of what that person does. Or, you know, it's, it's murder or adultery or homosexuality. Those are sins. Those are what, you know, are corrupting our world. Yet we miss out on our pride, our self-reliance, our just living life and having areas of our life where God is just not included. That's every bit as much sin as those other things that I mentioned. And so sin is saying, God, I don't need you. Or living life saying, I don't need you in these areas of my life. 
And so it's important that we understand God's definition of sin. Let me read from Romans chapter 1. I think this will be on the screen. It says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. Okay, so we're in our mind, we're thinking godless and wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. But then look at verse 21. For although they knew God, what was their big tragedy here? They neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to God. So we can say, yes, sin, wickedness, the corruption, the things of this world, but what about our attitude of not treasuring Christ, not treasuring God the way that God desires to be treasured and deserves to be treasured? And so we have to get it. We have to understand and grasp what it is about me and you, what it is about you that required the God-man Jesus to come and to give his life and die on a cross so that we can be saved. What is it about you that cost God his son? Do we really grasp that, that evil? Do we really grasp the root of that? Just life independent of God. I want to illustrate, nothing falling from the ceiling today, I promise. Um, I want to illustrate this, and, and this illustration kind of will go on throughout the sermon, but I just want us to allow this dirty, filthy water here to represent us. And just to add some added uh, flavor to it, I'm going to add some sardines in here just to make it smell as bad as it should. Don't flick that on me here. All right, so feel free to come and, and drink this if you'd like. But I just want this to be a visual representation of our lives. That's nasty. Of sin. We'll just th turn around that way so you can see the, the juice running down. And so I want you to, as you look at that, I want you to think about life apart from God is a life that is ridden with evil, sin, depravity. And let that be a visual illustration of that. Here's what Romans 2.5 says. Oh, thanks. It says, Romans 2.5, Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. For his righteous judgment will be revealed. I know that sounds like gloom and doom, and it sounds like, I'm good. Oh, I thought you were bringing that to me too. I know that sounds, it sounds terrible and, and like, oh, God's wrath, but we have to get a hold of this idea of what sin cost God. Because if we're going to understand why we've been redeemed and why we've been forgiven and what that significance that means in our lives, then we have to grip our minds around this idea that sin cost something. And it cost, Romans 6.23, um, the wages of sin is death. Death requires a penalty, and a price. And that penalty and that price is death. Jesus said, Verily, truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. So you got this idea that through sin, we inherited that we're in captivity, we're in bondage to this. There's no escaping. In fact, the Bible says that there's nothing known righteous, no not one. Apart from Christ, we can do some good things according to this world's definition of good, but there's no good that comes out of us. We're corrupt. God's wrath is against us. And so death is a price that had to be paid for our redemption. So look back at verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. So death was required. And so if we understand how awful our sin is, we understand there had to be a price paid and there had to be redemption to take place. And what is redemption? Redemption is a word that means throughout Scripture, it means, and just in general, it means the buying back of somebody who's in slavery, paying the price for someone, to buy out someone. And Paul definitely had in his mind, as he's writing this passage of Scripture, he's thinking about the Hebrew children 
who were in bondage in Egypt. Pharaoh, who at that time was more than just a king, he was viewed as a god. Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh responds, I don't think so. And so Moses says, well, God's going to bring his wrath on you unless you let these people go. After a series of plagues and, and, and judgments, finally it gets to the point where they have to, God has to bring his wrath so severely that Pharaoh had but one option, and that was just to let God's people go. He told, God told his people, he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and take a spotless, perfect lamb, and I want you to take the blood of that lamb, and I want you to put it on your doorposts. And what's going to happen is the angel of death will come into the city, into the country that evening, and every doorpost that has the blood on it, the death angel will pass over. But all those who don't, the firstborn son of each one of those families will die. And that's the picture Paul has in mind when he talks about the blood. In him, we have redemption through blood. And so a penalty was required. The result of this lamb's blood was the wrath of God passed over those who had the blood and his, his wrath was diverted. And so all this was symbolizing the fact that sin rules over us. It enslaves us. But Jesus, the Lamb of God, whose blood was shed, for us so that we can have live, so, uh, who, so we can have live and have life. So here's what I want to illustrate. Christ's blood, his death that comes and it covers over us and our sins. So when we put our faith in Christ, our hope in Christ, then God says, when I look at you, I don't see all this junk in your life. I don't see the sin in your life. I've forgiven you. I see Jesus. I see the blood of Christ the Lamb of God who was slain for us. And so when God looks at us, he sees a redeemed, forgiven child because of the blood of Christ. And so the question to ask yourself now is, if I understand sin, does the love I have for Jesus and the thankfulness for his grace correspond to the horrors that I was rescued from, the evil that I was rescued from? So if we get a grasp of our sin, our depravity, how deeply it runs in us and how much we need a Savior and how much, as Paul will say in a second, his grace was lavished on us, it changes our perspective. All of a sudden, it increases our love and value for our Savior tremendously because we realize there's nothing good in us. There's nothing righteous in us apart from the blood of Jesus that covers us. And so he says, in him we have redemption. He bought us back. He paid the price. Death was required. Jesus substituted his place in our place. And because of that, we find life, eternal life through Jesus Christ. But he says, also forgiveness of sins. And we, we've touched on this the last few weeks, but if we really think for this from a human perspective about forgiveness and how that God can truly not hold our sins against us, it's pretty amazing because we're not wired that way, are we? We're not wired at all. Think about people in your own life who have wronged you or you've wronged. You can't help but if it was significant to let that taint you in some way or them taint you themselves in some way as they deal with you. It just clouds your vision. I mean, from even simple stuff, back when I was in college, I worked for a sporting goods store, and one day I was back on the shelves, and I was digging around trying to find something, and my manager, she had a ceramic coffee pot, a really nice coffee pot, but some way I managed, as I was reaching in and digging some stuff out, she had that coffee pot sitting right there on the shelf, and I knocked it off, it fell off, and it broke into several pieces. Well, being the responsible young man that I was, I just laid it back on the shelf and thought, you know what, I'm not going to tell her I did that. I'm not going to tell her who's responsible. I'm just going to, you know, I I just don't want to deal with it. It was an accident, so, you know, I'm I'm okay. And so I went about my business. Well, a couple days later, she approached me, and she was an older lady. Um, At that time, I thought she was really old. She's probably like 40, you know, five years younger than me or so. (laughs) And, And she approached me, and her name was Faye, and she said, John, do you know anything about the coffee pot back there in the back? Oh, your coffee pot. 
Yes, it's broken. Were you, were you working when that happened? Yes, ma'am, I was. Did you, do you know what happened to it? And I just kind of hung my head, you know, and I said, my bad, I, I, I did it. I, I knocked it off accidentally. And she said, John, if you would have just told me you did it, it would have been okay. But it bothers me that you just act like it didn't happen and you just put it away and then went about your business. And from that day forward, as long as we worked together, there was just something different about our relationship. She could not let that go. She could not, and I don't want to say for, not forgive me, it was a coffee pot, but it tainted our relationship. And so that's all we know. And so you think about God's forgiveness, and those of you who have really not been saved from much, God's forgiveness doesn't seem that big a deal. For those who have lived a life so horrific and like Paul, so terrible, maybe you struggle with the thought that God, can he really, when he looks at me, not see this under here, the shame, the the remorse, the hurt, the damage, the awful, awful things that I've done. Can he really, when he looks at me, he just see the blood of Jesus? Is that possible? And so God forgave us. When he looks at us, he no longer sees us that way. He sees us as redeemed, forgiven, sins forgotten, relationship restored, new identity. We're not sinners. We said a few weeks ago, we're saints. We're holy. That's our identity. That's who we are in Jesus. And then Romans tells us in 6.16, it says, we're no longer slaves to sin, but now we're slaves to to righteousness. Not only did Jesus save us, but he said, I've broken those chains. That slavery that you were in to sin, to your selfishness, to your own agenda in life, living life apart from me, maybe not the terrible stuff, but living life on your own terms apart from Christ. I've broken the chains of that. Now you have the ability through Jesus and the Holy Spirit who lives in you to live your life completely different. You could be a slave to righteousness. And then the verse I alluded to uh, a minute ago, the section of the verse, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, in accordance with the riches of, his, of God's grace that he lavished on us. He says his grace that he poured out undeservingly to us, just lavished it on us, just poured out no matter how bad our sin is. He just poured out his grace, and it was more than enough to cover it, anything and everything. So redeemed, forgiven. So amazing, so significant if we truly, truly get a grasp of our sin. So a couple responses today. First of all, if you've never, ever put your faith in Jesus, truly put your faith in Jesus, if you're still in this condition right here, detestable, your heart is wicked, sin runs down to your core, you are a sinner, that's your identity. What do you do? You put your faith in Christ. You let Jesus Christ forgive you. Past, present, future sins. You're holy, you're a saint, you're righteous, you're adopted, you're chosen, you're elected, all those things that he's been telling us, that's who you become in Jesus. Your identity is completely different. It's totally changed. But what about those who are sitting here and you're saying, okay, done that. I'm a Christian, pretty sure about that. But you know what? God may see me this way, but here's what I feel like right here. I I, I just feel like my life's a mess. There's all kinds of junk in there. There's shame. There's remorse, regret. And all I can think about any time I try to live for Christ, all I do is default back to that old mindset, that way of life that I hate. And God says, I want you to live out your identity, who you are in Christ. You say, I can't. It just seems like all I do is think about my life prior to Jesus. All I do is get caught up in in the messes that I created myself. And maybe even some who came to Christ, and then you continue just to fill yourself with junk and living life apart from Jesus, even as a Christian. And you say, I just feel defeated. We're going to do things a little bit different today. 
We're going to break here in the middle of the message to take communion. And communion is an incredible time, and it's one of those things, again, we do so often that we lose its significance. You remember a few weeks ago when we talked about, from, uh, about covenant renewal? Well, communion is a covenant renewal with God. It's thinking about what He did on the cross for us, His death, His burial, His resurrection. And we ponder the significance of Christ and what He did. And we renew our covenant with Him. God, I look into my life and I see that I've not reflected upon the cross. I've not lived out through the power of the Holy Spirit the life that you called me to live. I've been selfish. All I do is keep my eyes on myself. I try to live life apart from you. I leave here and have that spiritual amnesia. What do you do? Today during this time of communion, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, to truly, truly begin to believe what God has spoken over you to be true. That you are blessed, holy, chosen, adopted, righteous, redeemed, forgiven. I want you to trust God in faith that that is true of who you are. That's your identity if your faith and hope is in Christ. And then secondly, I want you to just be honest with yourself. How, how, do, how much do we struggle with that in a church that we feel like we have to play a game, we have to put on a certain perception that we have together, and, and we live in this way that we pretend like we're managing our life okay. But God sees us in the stark naked reality, and He sees who we are. He understands all this stuff completely. Yet He says, in Jesus, I love you the same. I don't want to leave you in that condition. Talk about that in a few minutes. But I see you because of Jesus as holy. So be honest with yourself and be honest with God. As we begin to take the Lord's Supper, I want you to just be honest with God. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you, maybe you're thinking, whoa, hold on a second. I thought you just said that I was forgiven. You are forgiven. But just like in your family, if you and your spouse get into an argument, what happens? You get an argument, and the relationship is temporarily severed. You know, she's, she's at fault. He's at fault. What do you do? You go back to one another. You confess. Babe, I'm sorry. Screwed up there. I, I, I'm, I'm wrong. You confess it. You make it right. You renew that relationship. The same thing in your relationship with God. We confess. The word confess is an interesting word in the original language. It means to say the same thing as. And so we agree with God. God, I agree with you that greed is a sin, God, and it's eating up my life. Or I agree with you that adultery is a sin. Or God, I agree with you that pride that you're pointing out in my life is a sin. And I'm trying to live apart from you in these areas. And I confess, God, I agree with you. You're right and I'm wrong. You see the humbling effect that has on us when we begin to speak the truth and God begins to speak truth through us and in us and we agree with Him and say, I'm not believing the lies of Satan, the lies of the devil, who want to tell me it's okay in these areas to be greedy or, or to commit adultery because I'm not, this is not happening in my life or you don't know the extenuating circumstances in this situation. And we begin to negotiate and God's truth comes in and says, no, here's the deal. And your response can only be God. You're right. I agree. And I'm wrong. I confess it. And then rehearse the gospel. Thank you again and again and again for the cross. Thank you again and again and again that my only hope is in Jesus. My only hope is in Him. So I'm going to ask Mitch and the band to come up, and we're going to sing nothing but the blood of Jesus.
And I want you to take this time with the song just to allow it to be a time to reflect. So it won't be a 90-minute amnesia. And a time for God to really, really penetrate deep into your heart and allow him to expose the things that we have there that just aren't pleasing to him. So the question is now, how can we get our lives to reflect more of the way God sees us, our identity in Christ? How does that happen? Because it's frustrating. It's so frustrating, isn't it? We're thankful for God and His forgiveness. But we want to live lives that are true to Christ. I think that in this next part, Paul gives us some of the answers to that. It says, look in verse 8, the second part of verse 8, it says, With all wisdom and understanding, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He proposed in Christ, purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth and under earth. So do you get what he just said? He said that God has this plan and he's inviting us to be a part of that plan to live out and we don't fully get the plan. Let me read it from the New Living Translation because I think it's a little clear in this. He says, he showered us with kindness along with all wisdom and understanding, God has now revealed to us His mysterious plan regarding Christ, a plan to fulfill His own good pleasure. And this is the plan that at the right time He would bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and earth. So do you get the picture of what he's saying? He's saying it's like the soldiers who attacked the beaches of Normandy on D-Day. He's saying that these soldiers were given their order. They didn't understand exactly the whole plan, what exactly Eisenhower was trying to accomplish other than victory here. They didn't understand the big picture, but they knew that this is my task. This is what I've been called to do, and I'm going to do my job. And that's what Paul is saying in this passage. He's saying that God has a plan, and all that plan is going to come together through Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's always been all about Jesus. From the Old Testament pointing forward to the, to the door in, in Egypt, the blood of the Lamb, all that pointed to Jesus Christ. And it's not done on the cross. It's not done at the resurrection. It's going to continue to be fulfilled until Jesus returns and sets everything right. Everything that's broken. This world, people who have put their faith in Christ will be made whole. For now, Paul says in Corinthians, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, the plan will make sense. He's shown us what we need, which is Jesus Christ crucified, the gospel, the hope for everyone, and his will for us to go and to touch lives with that truth, to touch lives with the gospel. And so, I think practically we can apply this to our illustration here this way. And I hope this will make, make you help you, re, you remember this. God sees us as holy. But our mindsets, our attitudes are still corrupt. We're still human. We still have the flesh. We're still, all that stuff you had before Christ, unfortunately, just doesn't disappear out of your mind. It's still there. And it'll always be there for some, at some degree. So what do you do? God's will. God, I have a mission. I have a purpose. You have a plan for my life. I may not understand how it's all going to fit together, but I do understand that you've called me to minister. Not in a spot, or a position. You've called me to minister to people. It's all about loving people and loving God by loving others. And we begin to allow God's Word and His will for us to flush our lives out. And I'm going to try not to make a big mess here, but as we allow God's Word to more and more come into our lives, and as we desire to live more and more for God's will. He begins to flush out some of the junk that's in our life.
And we call this sanctification. It's a lifelong process. We don't become Christians and all of a sudden, it all takes care of itself. But eventually, over and over time, the water becomes clear and pure. And I'm making a mess. But you get the idea. If I continue to pour more and more water, we get clearer and clearer to eventually could flush it all out. And I hope that will be a, a reminder to you that if we wake up, and we, we talked about this last week about our mindset, God, help me to bless you this week. Not just, God, bless me, bless my day, help things to fall in place for me, but I wake up and I say, God, help me to bless you today. And in God's Word, He's flushing out the garbage. He's protecting us from the garbage. We're in the world, but not of the world. We're, come to, we're exposed to things, but we allow God's Word, to the truth of God's Word, to say, I'm not going to buy into the lies of Satan. I'm trusting God by faith in His Word that I know that I'm hiding in my heart so I won't sin against God. I'm putting myself in the right places, in the right situations, exposed to the Word again and again and again. And over time, our lives will begin to look a lot different. Thankfully, God sees this. Everybody else may see this. And what do we do? Ah, oh, they're such a mess. I don't want anything to do with them. And God says, your life, it was messy at once too, and it probably still is messier than you think it is. But you know what? I see them the same way I see you, which is I see the blood of Jesus Christ that forgives us of our sins. God's master plan, not ours. God's will, not ours. Blessing God, not being blessed. Loving others, more than we love ourselves. That's our call. Redeemed, forgiven, our lives have value, significance because of Jesus. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gospel. Just the simple truth of the gospel that cost us nothing but cost you everything, God. We thank you for Jesus. And it's so easy to forget in our day-to-day -day lives and get that amnesia and walk out of here just, just unaware of the difference that you made in our life and the night and day difference, the moving from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And God, I pray you'll help us to allow your will and your word to flush through us. God, change our hearts the way that only you can do through your Spirit's power. We thank you that you gave us an important part to play in your eternal plan. God, help us to live that out this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.